Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 91. So today's questions are taken from the 5 minute guide to HMS Hermes and the Wednesday special on survival at sea, how to escape a ship that is being disagreeable. So with that let us commence with the answering of the questions. James B asks, I'm curious, did Hermes armoured, quote-unquote, flight deck, help her at all against the attacking dive bombers, and how many bombs did it take to sink Hermes? So this is a bit of an interesting question, because, I mean, obviously it didn't help entirely, because she still sank. However, from all the accounts that I can find, it seems that a consistent figure is reported, which is 40 hits. Now, she was attacked by D3A Val dive bombers, which usually carried a 550-pound bomb, for a ship of her size, 40 bombs to put her under is a heck of a lot of ordnance. Now, granted, there's probably not every single one of them needed to sink her. There's probably a point at which she was going down anyway, and the rest of the bombs just kind of helped rearrange the rubble and debris. But it still suggests she was a very tough customer, especially, as I say, given her size and age. Now, the armoured flight deck... In this case, well, you struggled to call it armoured for World War II stands. It was an inch thick. Um, it was armoured, but you could classify it as armoured at the time she was launched. But anyway, now, it's not thick enough to resist a 550-pound bomb. Uh, that much we can immediately say. I mean, well, apart from anything else you can see from this picture of her sinking, there are several holes in her flight deck indicating that, no, it very well did not um, prevent the 550 pounders from blowing holes in the deck and below. However, and this is also a factor when you're talking about the later armoured carriers that had thicker flight decks that were resistant to the 550 pound bomb, what I suspect in extrapolating from the number of bombs that she took before going down as well as the performance of the other armoured carriers when faced with various size bombs with their own uh, thicker armoured flight decks is that the one inch deck, although it didn't stop the 550 pounders, it would have initiated them on impact and it would have slowed them down quite considerably as compared to just a generic deck. Because, of the, I mean, there's two things to remember. One is how thick the deck is in the first place and what material, and also what materials it's made of, because armour steel is different to structural steel, which we have covered in other videos, but just bears repeating. A one-inch thick flight deck made of standard structural steel is not the same as a one-inch thick armoured deck, unless, of course, to a certain extent if you were making it out of STS steel, but even then there are subtle differences. But anyway, the general point is that by initiating the bombs that high in the ship, what it would have meant is that those bombs would have then detonated either on contact, if they're general purpose bombs, or if they were semi-armour piercing or armour piercing bombs, they would have penetrated the deck, but having been slowed down and initiated, would have then detonated probably somewhere in the hangar. Now, that would have been obviously very bad for the ship's ability to carry and operate aircraft if she'd had any, which she didn't at the time, but critically it would have meant that all of these explosions were taking place high in the ship, which is bad for the crew and it's bad for it being on fire and things like this, but it doesn't actually compromise the ship immediately as a floating ma uh, machine, as a operational warship. And more importantly, in terms of her ability to manoeuvre and possibly make a run for it, the engines, etc., are obviously also quite deep in the ship. The only thing that's relatively high in the ship that's connected to the propulsion mechanisms is the funnel. And so you could do an awful lot of structural damage to uh, the ship without compromising its ability to stay afloat. Obviously, once you start blasting more and more holes in the deck, there's chances for bombs to go through the areas that have been opened up and penetrate deeper and cause more damage 
more critical damage in terms of staying afloat and also you've got near misses and such like which would if they're close enough open up the, the sides of the ship and yeah obviously having massive holes in your flying hangar deck and lots of fire going on is not good for the survival of the ship but kind of i mean it's a much more extreme example but if you look at something like uss franklin um when it was set on fire by the various bomb hits the risk of the ship sinking was more to do with further explosions that were occurring on board as well as the amount of weight that was being imposed on the ship by the firefighting efforts all the foam and water running down the size of the hull underwater were not blown open by the strike and i suspect that part of the reason for the silly number of bombs that it took to put down hermes is probably due to this you basically they had to erode away enough of her um, defenses her physical defenses in order to then start doing the real damage that would send her to the bottom so did it help at all yeah probably did um and as I end terms, how many bombs seems to have been quoted at 40. Um, although, obviously, that's how many bomb hits. That seems to be how many hits she took, not necessarily how many bombs it took to actually sink her, as I said at the beginning of this answer. And you can actually see this effect as well in um, a number of other armoured carriers. For example, in the Mediterranean, there's at least one instance of a 2,000 pound bomb hit, which. <laughs> Um, not to put too fine a point on it, but on something like a, a Yorktown, that would have punched really deep into the ship and done some horrifically serious damage, possibly even fatal. On the armoured carrier, it still did a, quite a nasty bit of damage, but it punched through the armoured deck of that carrier. But again, it was initiated, slowed down, detonated in the hangar levels, and therefore didn't compromise the ship's ability to stay afloat. And this is this and other incidents are kind of where I'm drawing my inferences on what happened to Hermes based on the available information. Griops or Griops asks, I have an age of sail question related to gun ports. Exactly how watertight were they? We all know stories about Mary Rose and Vasa swanning around with the ports open and sinking as a result, but what about when they were closed? The way wood expands and contracts when wet or dry, they must either have been very leaky or jammed shut, depending on dryness. Did they just keep out the worst of the weather in the rough seas, leaving hours of pumping fun for the crew, or were they really quite effective? So gun ports were actually quite effective. Um, you've got to remember that wooden warships, as far as was at all possible, would be built out of seasoned wood and then painted. So the expansion and contraction of the wood that made up their main structural elements, while it was there, um, wasn't necessarily quite as bad as might be otherwise imagined. But on top of that, because obviously you did have some expansion and, con and contraction nevertheless, Gun ports, like many other aspects of wooden warships, were a lot more complex and better thought through than might initially seem to be the case when you just look at them as, well, it's a wooden lid. They had to follow the curve of the hull, so that in and of itself meant they weren't just a straight piece of planking. Um, but also, as you can see from this diagram, and there's another one that I'll put up later on in the question, they weren't just a few strips of planking held together with some nails. They were actually two-part structures so you had a smaller opening that pierced most of the hull and this would then be stopped up by a set of vertical planks and these vertical planks would be attached to the back of the external gun port which would be part of the outer sheathing of the hull and that would be the bit that was flush with it and these would be made up of horizontal planks and then those that horizontal planked section would then be the thing that was on the hinges and there'd be various ropes and stuff to allow you to open it all. And the idea being that the internal vertical timbers, which as you can see there are a bit smaller than the horizontal timbers, would fit nicely into the main piercing through the hull. And then even if this wasn't a completely snug fit, you've got this overlapping lip on all four sides, which uh, then sits on top of that piercing and is part of the outer hull, hull structure. So what this all means is that when you have something pressing in, like say the weight of water trying to get in, then even if the seal isn't perfect, and there are examples where seals were coated with uh, tar or bitumen or bitumen-treated rope or various other things, um, 
but even if that wasn't the case, the weight of the water itself would push those gun ports back into the ship. And with that kind of lidded nature, um, that, that lip would then form a fairly hard seal unless the port had warped really badly. But never underestimate the uh, the straightening out powers of several thousand metric tons of water. Um, it, it's, got, it's got quite the kick to it. And as you can see, perhaps better in this diagram as well, because it's got to be part of the side of the ship, it's also going to slot in um, a lot better. It's not just going to be sort of a free swinging hatch, even even if you ignore the uh, the two part nature of it. There's going to be a limit to how far back it can actually go um, before it uh, basically jams itself shut. That's not to say they're entirely perfect. Obviously, in really high seas or on an old ship or something that's not been particularly brilliantly maintained, you would get some leaking but nowhere near as bad as what you might think otherwise. Yeah, there might be a bit of pump work in really bad weather, but that's a lot better to, than uh, finding yourself at the bottom of the ocean floor unexpectedly. Richard Orta asks, Have any small nations managed to build their own ships in World War I, World War II, or between the two? So, yes, quite an, well, I mean, it depends how you define small, but quite a number of what you might classify as small nations did manage to build their own ships. I mean, the Netherlands, for example, geographically is a small country, but pretty much all of their navy was self-built, um, both before, during, and after both world wars. Um, the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, uh, built, as you can see in this picture, um, built its own coastal defence ships, etc. The Norwegians did a bit more overseas buying, but even so, they did also build a number of ships, primarily destroyers, for their own navy. And kind of that, that list goes on. So yeah, there, there were quite a number of both geographically, well, not maybe not geographically in the case of Norway, uh, but um, there were some geographically small countries such as Sweden as well as population wise and economy wise small countries such as Norway um, which were perfectly capable of building their own warships as the obviously as the country went further and further down the scale in terms of size and economy both the size of navy they could have and whether or not they had any native shipyards capable of building those uh, vessels it became less and less uh, possibility and more and more if you want a ship you're gonna to have to buy it from somebody else but the threshold for able to construct your own warship at least at that time was actually surprisingly low Helschbiker asks do you know the reason why hermes didn't have a full-length squared off flight deck at the front and instead had a traditional shaped deck so in part it comes down to the fact that she was an, a very early carrier. Um, if you look at a lot of the early carriers, um, obviously you've got Hermes, you've got Hosho, Eagle, etc. They all have this kind of traditional shaped bow that the flight deck kind of ends on. Um, and so the flight deck itself is also shaped into this pointed um, f f a manner. Now, there were some slightly later early carriers, like, say, the uh, the Langley, and then obviously a lot of the conversions, albeit not all that were dictated by the Washington Naval Treaty, uh, that had the more standard nowadays squared off flight deck. But part of that came in uh, came from the fact of what you were designing the ships for in terms of environment, as well as... Um, just the fact that obviously with very early carriers they were still working out exactly what worked best um, and there's also a certain amount of aerodynamics so with an enclosed bow like you can see here with Hermes it's basically almost impossible for water to get into the hangar deck um, because the, the flight deck just sits on top of the hull and if the water's coming through the front of the hull you probably have more problems than a couple of damp planes Whereas if you have your, your flight deck separated from the main hull, then you can obviously have your flight deck higher up um, and you can have it whatever shape you want. Squared off is obviously relatively easy from a structural point of view. 
but you run the risk of obviously what's between the upper part of your hull and your flight deck is now at risk from the heavy seas some something like langley this might result from a desire to have an open hangar deck it might result from your hull just not being high enough to get the hangar the flight deck high enough above the water for your tastes there could be a whole host of reasons why you do that as opposed to something like this but the other reason which i mentioned was aerodynamics and that is because a lot of um the early experiments with carriers especially with things like furious did point out that any kind of ship structure can cause turbulence and turbulence is the enemy of any aircraft but especially the enemy of something that's moving around made of wood canvas and piano wire like a lot of the early carrier aircraft were and so an awful lot of wind tunnel testing went into trying to establish how you could minimize that turbulence and in actual fact, without a fair bit of additional modelling, the squared off flight deck is actually terrible for turbulence. It And the this kind of fared in flight deck is better, which is why you see on things like Akagi, Karga, Furious, Glorious and Courageous, they spend a lot of the interwar period with these kind of tongue or shoe shaped uh, fronts of their flight decks, which from above look kind of like... Uh, a fared in bow maybe just slightly less pointy as well as being curved down somewhat and this was all designed to minimize the turbulence caused by that front of the flight deck cutting through the air as the ship moved forward now obviously there are advantage certain advantages to having a squared off flight deck in terms of usable area etc and as an ease of construction um but there are disadvantages with when it comes to turbulence and those weren't completely ironed out until significant improvements in how you actually built the bow structure were developed during the interwar years and then obviously would it be exhibited on much later carriers now one of the things you do have to bear in mind in that respect as well is that the a lot of these early conversions, although people were obviously converting ships into carriers, there was budgetary concerns to take into account. And when you are doing this kind of uh, conversion work, it's much, much easier to just, if you're doing, say, a something like Eagle, to just say, okay, that's where the hull is. We can take it up a bit a little bit along these lines and then we're just going to fit the flight deck flush to it and with the hermes this kind of hull is what you know this is what we build job done as opposed to um if you if you want this kind of squared off flight deck you have to accept the turbulence concerns and you're also detaching it as we said from the from the bow and it's only when you get these kind of complete change based on a lot of this experience in bow design that you see in things like say Ark Royal or Yorktown that you can address most of the aerodynamics and turbulence concerns caused by the squared off flight deck and thus have the advantages of it without the significant disadvantages that early squared off decks had. Todd Ull asks, hey Drag, it's curious to me how it seems like the USA did such an amazing job in World War II with damage control and then during the Vietnam War, USS Forrestal happened. I've looked at the Navy's report and the cause, as well as the timeline of the disaster. Did the US Navy forget the lessons it learned in World War II? Now, normally obviously I don't venture into this era of shipping, but this is directly connected to the subject of the video and also mercifully for once is actually a relatively clear-cut case so i'll make a minor exception yes to a certain degree the u.s did forget the lessons of world war ii at least in this particular respect as if you've watched that video on damage control you'll know one of the greatest strengths of the u.s navy in world war ii especially when compared to the japanese navy was the fact that everyone could and did pitch in for damage control effort that's when ships were on fire or otherwise in danger of being lost and just the sheer number of hands on deck made a huge difference in quite a lot of cases unfortunately for whatever reason the u.s navy in between decided they were going to go with specialized damage control teams 
so that everybody else could get on with their own jobs. And if that sounds familiar, yes, that is exactly the approach that the Japanese used in World War II and which had worked out so spectacularly badly for them. Um, now, that wasn't quite all of it, though. Um, there, With that particular incident on the Forestal, there was a relatively decent chance that even with the specialised damage control teams, the incident could have been brought under control if everything had been going as normal, if Forrestal had been armed with all its standard equipment. However, in this particular case, they had been given quite old, obsolete and degraded bombs in a recent resupply run, and they'd been told that the bombs that were fitted to their aircraft could last for about 10 minutes in a fire, and then if they did go off, it would be a fairly low-order explosion. So when the fire started, the damage control teams came in, they started playing the hoses, they saw that some of the bombs were in the fire, they thought, oh, that's not a problem, um, we'll keep hosing them down, worst comes to worst, it'll be a low-order explosion and we'll be fine. And it turned out that these old and obsolete bombs with their degraded explosives were anything but that, and in less than two minutes thousand pound bombs started detonating everywhere which pretty much wiped out all the damage control teams um, almost but not entirely to a man and the ones that were left weren't in much of a state to do anything that kind of complicated things quite significantly now obviously if there were a few semi-mobile survivors of the damage control teams and obviously the rest of the forestals crew especially in the absence of said control teams did pitch in to uh, bring the thing under control but obviously without the same levels of training and expertise etc that had been granted to the, the average crewman in world war ii it took longer i mean the fact that there were multiple exploding thousand pound bombs and ten and thousands and thousands of liters of burning jet fuel going everywhere didn't help uh, that scale of disaster is far in excess of anything you could have expected to have found on an essex class in world war ii but still there are it could have gone a lot better and despite the fact that obviously that was something of a unique circumstance, it still did illustrate almost perfectly the exact lessons that the Japanese Navy had been forced to learn in World War II, which was that regardless of if it's a standard uh, method of destruction or an unexpected one, a few highly specialised fire, uh, firefighting and damage control teams can, and often will, get wiped out very early on, which makes the eventual salvage of the ship from the situation a considerably harder task, if at all it is possible um, in any circumstance. Obviously with the Forestal they did manage to get it back eventually, but at a very high cost in lives. Craig Hagenbruch asks... In terms of nations' navies rescuing their foes after sinking their ships, are there any cases of the Imperial Japanese Navy doing the same as the Japanese were known to just leave them there and kill any survivors? Yeah, unfortunately with the Japanese Navy, it was usually a case of roll 3d6 and, well, you're going to roll a 1 on at least one of those dice, just hope you don't roll triple 1s. Um, the Japanese Navy in World War II was something of an exception to the general rule of various navies rescuing each other's survivors, in as much as there were quite a few recorded instances of various Japanese ships, submarines, etc., when they saw survivors in the water of just gunning them down, um, which I guess would be rolling your triple one. Then there were cases of them just looking at them going, hmm. Okay, good luck with that, and sailing off, which would be a case of maybe rolling two ones. Um, now, granted, all navies at some point did have instances where their vessels sailed away and left survivors in the water, albeit that normally this was because there was some form of greater threat to the ship, submarine or aircraft sighted that might attack them. Um as opposed to quite a number of the Japanese Navy's incidents where they literally just sort of looked at them and went, hmm, inferior dishonourable people, we will leave them to drown deliberately without any particular other recourse uh, or reason to do so. And then finally, when you're only rolling the single one, you might actually get rescued. It, it did happen. Um, these people in the picture are 
survivors of USS Houston, for example. And uh, there were some survivors from, say, USS Tang, which we've uh, covered last month. However, the reason I say you're still rolling a one in that case is the, to be perfectly honest, being rescued by the Japanese Navy and taken to a Japanese internment camp, you might wish they'd left you to the sharks. Um, Japanese prisoner of war camps were not nice places by a long shot. Um, these guys, as you can see, not in the best of shape, and they're probably relatively lucky compared to some. Um, at least they weren't experimented on live, um, as some prisoners of war unfortunately were. But that's a bit grim, um, but it is something that did happen, so yes. Uh, short answer, yeah, the Japanese would occasionally rescue survivors. Um, however, you, you, you may not actually prefer that particular fate, um, albeit that there were some people who did obviously manage to make make it through the war in Japanese prisoner survivor camps with the worst they had to show for it being extreme weight loss. Apostolos Cristalis asks, in the last dry dock, uh, this would obviously have been a while ago, uh, you talked about the German doctrine evolving with the turret placements in ships, etc. Since the French ships like the Dunkirk or Richelieu class have all their firepower concentrated at the front of the ship, is that in line with a really offensive doctrine, or is there any other explanation? Well, obviously, if you've got all your guns forward, that doesn't enable maximum forward firepower when you're attacking your enemy, which does indicate a certain degree of offensive doctrine in play. But it's not just that. I mean, as has been covered when I've talked about both Richelieu and Dunkirk, as well as Nelson, having all your guns forward allows you to have a shorter citadel, which in turn means you can either have the same protection for less weight and thus devote that weight to other things, or you can have greater protection for the same weight as having fore and aft turrets. So there's a there's a protective advantage inherent in having all your firepower concentrated at the front of the ship. There is also certain savings to be made in terms of vulnerability. For example, if you have four and aft turrets, you have four and aft magazines, which means there are two sections of the ship rather distinctly divided from each other, where a very lucky hit can cause your ship to go boom. Whereas with uh, a, a ship that has all forward guns, obviously all the magazines are forward. Now granted, those magazines are probably going to have to hold more shells, so if they do go boom, it's going to be an even bigger boom, but there's no aft main gun magazine, which means a hit aft, like, say, the one that did in the hood, probably then isn't going to uh, split your ship in half in a colossal explosion, which is always a good thing. Um, and it obviously, especially when you have all that extra saved weight to play with, you can increase the armor over your magazines in, that are forward in order to make sure doubly so that they don't go boom. And part of that cost saving comes from the fact that even when you're making a quad turret, so looking at Richelieu here, you've got um, two quads instead of, let's say, four twins, but the overall barbette diameter and the space occupied by a quad turret is not twice that linearly of a twin turret. So if you have four twin turrets, more of your ship's length is going to be taken up with barbette and thus turret as opposed to with two quads and thus that's where one of your major um, distant length savings comes in terms of having to protect uh, citadel wise so yeah there's a number of explanations as to why you'd go with this all forward armament and uh, that that oh, those are the major ones and exactly what balance of those goes into any particular design decision to have a ship with all four and five power varies from ship to ship and of course navy to navy adam ladd asks battle of tsushima but with admiral rosesvensky given a competent crew and officers for his ships do the japanese still win probably not no but this does assume a certain degree of that old uh, trope of let's change one thing and hope that nothing else does. Now, if that is the case, I mean, Togo still has some advantages in that a lot of the Russian ships are just flat out inferior designs to many of his. 
and of course competent crew and officers or not they have just gone around the world a voyage that they were never designed to do so they're not in the best of shape they're they're slower they're going to be exhausted whatever the case and let's face it unless they are particularly scrupulous they're probably still going to have a fair bit of coal dust and paint on them increasing their flammability and of course the Japanese still have shimose uh, fillers on their shells which are going to be particularly deadly so all of those factors are still in Togo's favour albeit maybe you could say that the the flammability of the ships might be doused a bit given the, the amount of time they have and yeah a competent officer and crew might actually clean those off but anyway all that aside if Rosesvenski's um, subordinates are sort of up to spec or better than up to spec at their jobs. And Togo doesn't know about this, because if he did know about it, I doubt he would use exactly the same tactics. But let's assume for a minute he doesn't know about it or he discounts those reports. Then we would be reading about how Togo made a critical error. And that is, he crossed the Russian T. And then, as is pretty much depicted in this uh, particular image, he then turned his ships around in succession and came back up almost in parallel and then crossed the T again and batted away. This is exactly where his ships took a fair bit of a pounding in the run-up to and during this turn. And if Rosasvensky's crew and officers could shoot a bit faster and shoot a bit straighter they would have punished the Japanese immensely for this and for all the fact that some of their ships were outmoded the Russians still have a numerical advantage in terms of capital ships if say the leading three vessels or so in Rosasvensky's formation managed to concentrate their fire on the Mikasa and destroy or even cripple it badly damage it forcing the rest of the Japanese fleet that's doing its turn to start taking evasive action and evade around it, then not only have they probably deprived the Japanese fleet of their leader, um, and thus there'd be issues about who's going to take command instead, but also with their formation disrupted, the next ships coming along are going to have to slow down, they're going to have to start making turns, which is going to throw off their own gunnery, at which point the Russian fleet, which is obviously piling up in greater and greater numbers, can just repeat the process as each ship comes around and basically offers itself up as a static target until you've got a glut of burning and sinking Japanese ships at this turning point and the Russians are just pouring in fire to make sure they stay down. Uh, which would make for a very different battle of Tsushima, obviously. But as I said, whether or not Togo would go for precisely the kind of tactic that he did if he knew that Brzezinski's crew were and officers were really sharpened on their feet. Who knows? He might have done. He might still have made that. It may, have, it may well have just been a genuine tactical error on his part. Or he might have altered his tactics and gone for something different, in which case, obviously at that point, we don't know what the outcome would have been because it would have been so completely different. But there you go. Michael Hammond asks, how effective were Congreve rockets? It seems they were phased out in the mid-19th century. Could design changes have kept rockets as a viable weapon after the Age of Sail? I'm trying to imagine what naval rockets might have looked like if in World War I if rocket development had continued. Congreve rockets were actually a fairly effective weapon once the few initial bugs had been ironed out. However, they were effective in certain roles, and Congreve himself acknowledged this right off the bat. That is, they were very good at scaring people um, and causing casualties amongst infantry and other, obviously, unarmoured troops, if you're using the case shot rockets and such like. So, yeah, casualties in the field, morale degradation, and then also setting fire to large areas. So they were used, for example, in the bombardment of Copenhagen, as well as in a number of sieges, where these effects all combined, especially the whole sort of set fire to things. Now, if you're firing at a city or a large collection of moored ships, accuracy is not so much of a problem, because even if you miss what you're aiming at, you're probably going to hit something relatively valuable. 
uh, in another direction. But as far as pinpoint attacks go, probably not your weapon of choice. Since they did tend to go off in all sorts of weird and wonderful random directions. Uh, this is why, for example, you get the line in the American National Anthem by the Rockets' Red Glare. Those were Congreve rockets firing at Fort McHenry. And they didn't do all that much to it, because being a fort, it was fairly heavily built, and unlike medieval castles, had a distinct lack of flammable structures within. And without anything to particularly set fire to, the Congreve rockets' main use at that point was unnerving people. Albeit that they had a certain amount of effect in doing that. I mean, they were, they were never going to blow the fort apart, but especially for somebody at the beginning of the 19th century, seeing a adapted bomb ship rolling along firing rockets out of specially adapted tube ports in its side and bow would have been quite the unnerving sight so yeah the um the massive rocket launch converted rocket launching converted uh, lsts and such that you see on d-day no 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 they weren't the first the royal navy had full-on rocket artillery bombardment ships way back at the beginning of the 19th century now, the accuracy problem was solved to a degree in the mid-19th century as Congreve rockets were being phased out it, by the invention of the so-called Hale rocket, which was invented by a chap called Hale, unsurprisingly. And this used the actual rocket exhaust to impart a spin, whereas, as you can see with these ones, these used sticks attached to the rockets, um, which kind of similar principle to how modern fireworks uh, tend to function. However, rocket technology, the sort of the basic gunpowder powered rockets, etc., was still very much in its infancy. And they were then phased out with the last real usage kind of being around the 1860s until their advent once again in the Second World War, because in the intervening period, the various improvements to artillery meant that artillery vastly outranged rocketry whereas prior to sort of the mid 1860s rockets could compete with similar sized artillery pieces uh, in terms of range and obviously they had a high rate of fire they needed less support because you didn't have a massive gun to take with you etc so they had certain advantages albeit that they were less accurate than the average cannon so in terms of good design changes that kept rockets as a viable weapon after the age of sail yeah technically speaking the main thing would have been some kind of breakthrough in fuel source that would have extended the range of rockets and obviously if you're extending the range that means you've probably got more power in the fuel which means you can probably get bigger rockets so yeah large long range rockets if there'd been some kind of a breakthrough in fuel and stability systems. I mean, they had, as I say, they, they'd kind of solved some of the worst st uh, accuracy issues with the Congreve rockets, but still could have used a bit of room for improvement. That would have kept rockets as a viable weapon of some description going forward. Now, as far as how that would have been viable in naval combat, well, during the early ironclad period, ironclads still had fairly extensive sails and rigging so they would have been useful in that respect especially if they were loaded with some kind of incendiary payload set fire to the sails and rigging that's going to be something of a distraction to the enemy and at shorter ranges again you can use them with a case shot etc so firing them at almost horizontal over the decks of your enemies to scatter case shot all over their decks and kill a bunch of their crew again has some practical purposes but the chances of some kind of primitive anti-shipping missile being able to penetrate the armor of enemy ships that's probably not going to happen um certainly not with any kind of realistic possible breakthrough in rocket fuel technology in the 19th century however as ships gradually become more and more modern for the lack of better term more and more recognizable as the kind of precursors to the pre-dreadnought the armor that they have for their citadels gets thicker and thus the area covered by the citadel gets smaller so if you had an iron cased rocket or a steel cased rocket i mean the congreve rockets were were iron cased but if you had some kind of sort of 
basic armor-piercing rocket with a steel head or something like that, then in theory, they might have some use. I mean, we're still talking about an era of a distributed armor scheme, and it's not going to take too much in terms of armor to stop any realistically viable rocket from the 19th century. But in the areas where the ship is not armored, superstructure, some parts of the bow and stern, etc., an incendiary payload rocket at the kind of ranges that most naval combat was going to take place up up until the end of the 19th century might well have been a viable weapon, especially given that one of the advantages of rocketry over land-based artillery in the early 19th century was the rate of fire. And as we know, one of the reasons for the rise of the secondary battery in the latter part of the 19th century was the low rate of fire of main guns and the advent of the quick-firing gun. So for that 1860s, 1870s, 1880s period rocket batteries might well have if they continued this kind of development might well have had a use as the kind of explosive fire starting rapid fire barrage weapon instead of the quick firing artillery piece especially because again similar to the advantage they had in the early 19th century you don't need a gun to fire them at best you need a metal tube and so you can then close pack them in large numbers down further down in the ship and you could potentially unleash quite the frightening barrage at an enemy from 1,000, 2,000 yards or something along those lines. And at that point, given the inventiveness of the Victorian era people, you probably would have found them being used for all sorts of other things like possibly laying spoke illumination rockets, etc., etc. So, yeah. As to whether or not they would have then subsequently survived into the classic pre-Dreadnought and Dreadnought era, I'm not so sure, because around the 1900s you've got people like Admiral Fisher in the Royal Navy, Admiral Sims in the US Navy, uh, Percy Scott as well in the Royal Navy, making various advances that dramatically extend the effective range of gunfire. So you'd be looking at yet another um, need for a major breakthrough in rocket fuel and guidance systems if or just accuracy and at that point when ranges start to hit over 10,000 yards the chances of hitting anything with a manually sighted rocket are pretty slim uh, so I have a feeling that would have seen the death knell of the naval rocket until the sort of World War II period where you've got air aircraft carried rockets and then eventually obviously missiles uh, shipborne missiles post-war because that advance in fuel and guidance technology had occurred the, the fuel part obviously in the early to mid 1930s and then the guidance part just after the war and during it in some cases but there may have then been a continuous evolution of rocketry because even if the naval rocket dies out around sort of 1890s 1900s the technology probably at that point would have been transferable across to the army for various purposes which probably would have kept rocketry alive as a continuous process through until it became viable again as what the missile in the post immediate post world war 2 environment mark persad asks so arthur harris so the uh, acting commander-in-chief of bomber command in world war ii was on record as being vehemently opposed to four engine bomber types such as the avro lancaster being assigned to raf coastal command to counter the german u-boat threat rather than sent to the raf bomber command for the strategic bomber campaign against germany with hindsight would a greater uk built four engine bomber resource being made available to raf coastal command in 1942 to 1943 have shortened the u-boat campaign and even shortened the war in Europe. I think definitely so. The Avro Lancaster, which was just coming into service at the beginning of 1942, had more than enough range in its standard configuration to close the Mid-Atlantic Gap, a job that would, in the actual timeline, be fulfilled by B-24 Liberators, and of course the Liberators would still be very much welcome. Now, the reason I say it would have a definite impact is that Bomber Command, to their credit, did try to help with the Battle of the Atlantic by flying thousands of sorties against the U-boat pens. 
at the cost of quite a few aircraft and several hundred aircrew. However, the U-boat pens were incredibly tough and these raids didn't actually accomplish all that much until the advent of things like Tallboy and Grand Slam much later in the war. So given that those raids absorbed a fair number of four-engine bombers and accomplished not a lot, and given the effectiveness of even the relatively few long-range aircraft that Coastal Command was able to get their hands on, especially in 1942 and early 1943 when things were looking quite grim, the concept of diverting even, say, the first hundred production Lancasters from strategic bombing over to Coastal Command, that's not going to materially affect Bomber Command's ability to hit Germany all that much, considering just how many Lancasters were produced and the fact that, obviously, the very first production models, A, are obviously the least capable, and B, end up being scattered around various squadrons and so not able to use their increased payload and durability to the full effect that they would be able to do in mass numbers later on. So Bomber Command's not tremendously affected by that loss, but if you give Coastal Command in, say, spring, early summer 1942, 100 maritime patrol-equipped Lancasters, uh, able to base obviously out of UK bases, Iceland and Canada, and possibly even later on America, that is going to have a massive change in fortune. If you look at the effect, as I said, of even one or two liberators showing up over attacked convoys and what they're able to accomplish when Coastal Command's long-range force could be counted on a couple of hands. Putting that amount of aircraft into the sky, and bear in mind the Lancaster being as large as it was, could carry full-size depth charges and all the electronic gizmos and gubbins that were being invented for the Battle of the Atlantic, there would have been significantly more U-boat casualties, and whilst not armed to quite the same extent as the short Sunderland, the Lancaster still carried a respectable amount of machine gun firepower as well, so German U-boats would be ill-advised to try fighting one, uh, which uh, obviously they, they did try in the Bay of Biscay and such like, um, when it came to other coastal command aircraft. So, yeah, overall that would probably decrease losses during the the worst parts of the Battle of the Atlantic for the Allies, which obviously means more supplies get through, fewer ships are lost, fewer lives are lost, more escorts survive, etc., which in turn means that when Western Approaches Command finally managed to beat the U-boats in 1943, at least as far as the overall battle offensive is concerned, then they're going to have a lot more resources to do that, so they might be able to do it sooner. And even if it happens at around the same time, the defeat's probably going to be more crushing. And as I said, the U-boats will have failed to kill quite as many as they did in uh, mid to late 42 and early 43. So yes, effectively, that, that would have been a huge, huge benefit for sh uh, shortening the U-boat campaign. And of course, more supplies and fewer lives lost in the Battle of the Atlantic does mean supplies and such like can be built up in Europe a lot quicker and a lot a lot more safely. Um, now, whether or not that's going to shorten the war in Europe, um, D-Day has a narrow window in 44 when it can actually happen, and I don't think it would have shortened the war enough for them to consider launching D-Day in 1943, certainly. But it might shorten the war in Europe by a little bit, considering that, as we said, there would be more supplies, more equipment, etc. available. But to be perfectly honest, it's more going to be in terms of not necessarily the war ending much sooner than May the 8th, 1945. It's going to be more about the fact there are significantly less Allied casualties as a result when the war actually comes to a conclusion. Rachel Ann asks, Let's suppose Germany delayed starting World War II in Europe, but remained an active threat. At the end of 1941, Japan attacks Britain in order to enable conquest of Southeast Asia and Indonesia, and counts on US neutrality to keep them from intervening on Britain's side. With whatever small support Britain might get from France and the Netherlands, and with Britain still needing a home fleet to watch Germany, how does the Royal Navy fight Japan? What ships might they have sent? What strategy might they have pursued? And what were their prospects?' 
Now, this is a rather difficult scenario to judge because US neutrality is not really something that can be guaranteed. The Japanese are badly affected by the US embargo on fuel oil, and they have to get past the Philippines. There isn't really a plausible scenario in which the US controls the Philippines and the US controls most of the world's oil supply, in which Japan can go to war without dragging the US into it. And if they know they're going to drag the US into it, then it's basically going to be a case of Pearl Harbor. Nevertheless, in terms of the British response, it's going to be very interesting because the Royal Navy, when it was planning, was actually thinking of a war breaking out around sort of late 41, early 42, ideally maybe late 42, early 43, but nevertheless. And the number of ships they'd have available at that point would be very interesting because you'd see most, if not all, of the armoured carriers... Uh, ready to go, the illustrious class, along with uh, their der derivative half-sister, Indomitable. The Implacable's probably not quite ready yet. Vanguard, assume again, because there's no war, might have be, would have been under constant construction, it's probably not going to be quite ready, but would be able to be brought into service within, say, probably six to eight months, if they're quick. The Lion class are still going to be under construction, so they're not going to be available immediately but they would be substantially advanced in their construction. The cruiser force will have been upgraded quite significantly. There'd be a lot more of them in the water. The anti-aircraft conversions of, say, things like the C-class and D-class would, would be advanced. Uh, if we're talking late 41, you might even, <laughs> believe it or not, have Hood sitting in a dry dock somewhere being modernised, which would be fun. Um... All the King George V's are either going to be in service or maybe, in the case of Anson and Howe, in the process of working up again, because without war breaking out in thirty nine, that means for the second half of 1939, 1940, most of 1941, there's no wartime interruptions or delays in building things up. There's, although the Royal Navy is still going to be looking at increasing its escort numbers and destroyer numbers, Without the demands of Atlantic convoys, there'll be more destroyers available. And we're assuming, obviously, under this, that the Italians are staying out of it, the conflict as well. So whilst the Royal Navy would need ships to keep an eye on Germany and potentially Italy if they're still allied, they actually have a plan, a fairly substantial plan, for going to war with Japan. Be bearing in mind that Japan was probably threat number one for the majority of the interwar planning period. So in terms of the fleet that they go out to fight Japan with, you're probably looking at Ark Royal plus at least another three, possibly four carriers, because bear in mind it's not just the Illustriouses and Indomitable. you also got Furious, Courageous, Glorious, Eagle, Hermes, uh, for what value some of those are worth. So there's a fair number of carriers for them to draw upon at that point. The King George V, at least some of them are going to come out. Uh, Renown and Repulse are definitely going to be sent out because they are excellent ships to uh, try and take on the Japanese, especially given the Congo class are a thing. Obviously, you're going to have lots of town class cruisers, etc., already based over there, so they're going to have a bit of merry fun, one way or the other, at least. Um, you'll probably see at least a few more heavy cruisers being built. Now, they are not going to be strictly ready for service at this point, but again, they might be made ready for service within a year or so, because this war is probably going to be lasting longer than a year. The large submarines, like the T-Class, are going to be still over there, so they're going to be going and having a, a fair bit of fun, what with Japan's relative lack of anti-submarine warfare expertise, albeit that for all the fact they were designed for this kind of conflict, the T-Class were not necessarily the most air-conditioned of <laughs> submarines, so they did get a little bit warm when they're out over there. Also, and this might prove fairly decisive, whilst obviously war does accelerate development of technology in some respects, also limits the deployment and um, refinement of technology in some other respects. So if you're talking late 41, early 42, 
most of the Royal Navy, if not potentially all of its large ships, are going to be equipped with radar of probably a second generation variety in most cases. They're going to be looking at for night fighting opportunities. They're going to want to fight the Japanese at night because that's where they have their advantages. Now, obviously, the Japanese are also trained for night fighting, um, which is going to be a rather interesting uh, fight and uh, scenario. But the Royal Navy is obviously, as we said, equipped with radar, which gives them significant advantages when it's played right. And as we see from things like Matapan and such, like the Royal Navy does actually know how to use its radar properly in nighttime engagements, and their aircraft as well can operate at night. So there's probably going to be a fairly substantial fleet. As I said, you're probably looking at at least six to maybe even ten battleships, four carriers, four or five carriers maybe, um, dozens of cruisers and destroyers, i.e. a fleet that can quite a happily actually, at least in on sheer numerical terms, take on the majority of the Japanese fleet and win. Now, of course, the Japanese have Yamato and Musashi, which are in the process of commissioning, but assuming this happens at the end of 41, early 42, they're not quite ready yet. Um, so the British can definitely put a battle line down that can squash the uh, Nagato Ise uh, Fuso combo uh, along with the Congos quite easily. The air uh, part is obviously a lot more difficult because the Royal Navy will have fewer aircraft available than the Kidu Butai. What kind of aircraft they have and what their capabilities are is going to be a bit of an interesting one, though, because re re remember the fleet air arm going into war in 1939 with things like the Skewer, the Rock. Kind of the full mark coming on and the swordfish with another what ye two and a half years of war is coming we need to desperately get everything out into the field as much as possible it's pretty likely the fleet air arms going to be better equipped in terms of quality of aircraft um although say numerically they're going to have some some issues a lot of this engagement i think is going to come down to who hits who first and how if the, the, the Kido Butai probably has, a, an, well, almost definitely has an advantage in terms of a massive daylight strike, sort of Pearl Harbor start style waves of attack, whereas the Royal Navy has the unprecedented ability to strike quite heavily at night. So is it going to be a case of the Japanese find the Royal Navy formations first and launch a massive air assault? And does the Royal Navy survive that? Uh, does the combination of its anti-aircraft firepower, which of course will have been upgraded as well during those two and a half years of no war, combined with what fighters the FAA can put up, would that break up or blunt the Japanese air assault enough to allow them to strike back at night? Or would it be a case of the Royal Navy, either via submarine recon aircraft or whatever, spots the Japanese first, and the first thing the Japanese know is two o'clock in the morning, the buzz of swordfish and albacores and barracudas floating around and dropping torpedoes in places the Japanese would really rather they not be. Um, it's it's a very open-ended thing, and that's that's just looking at a kind of decisive battle. To map out an entire campaign of that nature would be the work of days, if not weeks, even on a very loose overall level. Um, so yes, it, it, hopefully that gives some indication of what might happen. The exact outcomes as I say it could be all over the place but it would need a lot of wargaming and a lot of uh, thinking uh, probably with a, a number of historians contributing to the ideas to get a clear idea of how it might actually have gone down. Matthaus Vorbruber asks, I, I think that's your name, um, why didn't the Admiralty take a look at the Great Eastern and order something similar along with probably every gun in the UK to equip it? Now, there are a whole raft of reasons why the Royal Navy didn't look at a Great Eastern size warship. And to give you some idea, yeah, look, look at this picture. There are some full sized ships of the period docked up next to it there. This thing was big. Now, one of the most obvious ones was cost. The Royal Navy knew just how much it had spent on the groundbreaking HMS Warrior, which was built very shortly after the Great Eastern. That was, depending on exactly how you calculate it, somewhere between three hundred and fifty and four hundred thousand pounds, and that was for the ship, its armor, which was very expensive at the time, and all of its guns, again fairly expensive at the time, 
Great Eastern, who knows how much that thing cost, Brunel thought it would cost half a million. However, various people put in some very low bids, then went horribly bankrupt because, well, yeah, they'd massively underbid. Costs spiralled. Um, the number of additional uh, cost additions for the Great Eastern is so dizzying that cost estimates for building it range from finally anything from around the same as the warrior to about double now that is also in taking into account it took an awful long time to do it almost didn't actually make it out of the shipyard because of its great weight and it was also whilst it was very redundant when it came to its forms of propulsion having as you can see both screws and paddles plus sails this also meant it was inefficient and whilst propulsion technology advanced quite quickly so that maybe by perhaps the late 1860s propulsion would have allowed them to take the paddle wheels off at the very least and just rely on screws and sails which would have been in line with the Royal Navy's ironclad doctrine at the time that price for the Great Eastern doesn't account for a hypothetical warship style Great Eastern where you'd have to protect the thing with who knows how much armour which would also vastly increase its displacement, which would also, as well as the displacement, massively increase the cost. And then you've got the cost of all the guns, which would be another matter entirely. The uh, yeah, the, the cost of arming that ship will be quite considerable. So you could quite easily be looking at 600,000, anything up to three quarters of a million pounds to build even a notional Great Eastern-style warship. And of course, once you've done that... Um, you've kind of laid down the gauntlet to everybody else, which means that not only have you just obsoleted at great expense of our, the vast majority of your wooden fleet by building HMS Warrior and her successor Ironclads, you'll have then pretty much done exactly the same thing again with your hypothetical Great Eastern Ironclad. And that's assuming you can even get the thing out of the shipyard. I mean, as I said, they had enough problems getting just the regular Great Eastern into the water, let alone a version that's weighed down by so much additional armour. And bear in mind that the Royal Navy has to be in many places at once during this period. And whilst it may, even all that issue aside, be technically and financially feasible to build a... HMS Great Eastern, shall we say, then you've got one massive super ship that can only be in one place at a time. Ironically enough, this is kind of uh, a shipbuilding strategy that would suit something like Germany or Russia, albeit that Germany didn't quite exist at this point, it was still Prussia, but anyway. Um, yeah, it would suit basically a smaller second-line navy albeit the Russians are fairly large, but they've got so many places to consider individually um, for, say, the, the Baltic fleet we're talking about. Maybe even Italy might look at it, albeit that they probably don't have the technological capability to do it around about this time, but nevertheless, the point is that if you've got a relatively small area of the world to defend, then something like this makes perfect sense because it can only needs to be in one place and it can see off almost all comers. For the Royal Navy... It's going to come at the cost of probably two to three other ironclads, and those two to three other ironclads can be in different places at different times. And of course, there's also the issue of serviceability, because if you've got, let's say, three ironclads, then you can guarantee to have one of them in service at any given time, at least, maybe two. If you've spent all that money on one Great Eastern sized vessel, then at least half, possibly even two thirds of the time, it's going to be out of action, refitting repairing, recruiting, etc, etc. At which point you're going to need three of them just to have one guaranteed in service. So you're going to be spending, what, probably the better part of maybe two million pounds, which is a huge amount in those that, those, that time's money, in order to have guaranteed one ship available in one theatre. Whereas for the same amount of money, you could probably knock out six, seven, eight ironclads, which at that point you can have two or three guaranteed in service, maybe even up to five, and they can be in all sorts of different places. So for a global navy like the Royal Navy, it just doesn't make sense. Practicality 
parts aside, just the strategy of it doesn't make sense either. Although it would be rather hilarious as a massive centerpiece flagship. And our lockdown bonus question for the day. Mason Asher Stewart asks, why did the Allies even bother with the Arctic convoys after the invasion of Iran in 1941? I know the sea lanes were shorter and less congested, but how could you justify that with a safe alternative via Iran located right next to India? Basically, it comes down to capacity. Now, don't get me wrong, they did use Iran as a transit for lend-lease supplies and such like to the Soviet Union. Depending on which book you read and whose figures you believe, it's something like a quarter to a third of all supplies sent to the Soviet Union by the Western Allies passed through Iran, and you can pretty much see why. It can come straight off of a boat through Iran and up into the southern part of the Soviet Union. However, there are a couple of major restrictions here. Firstly, the sheer distance involved going from southern Iran through the entire country up into the southern Soviet Union, skirting the southern edge of the German advance all the way up to the Urals and the other industrial heartlands of Russia, which are, in terms of north-south, near enough, although not quite as about as far away from this area as you could possibly hope to get. So... There's a massive logistics cost involved. There's also the fact that, not to put too fine a point on it, but even a really long train can only transport so much compared to a ship. Uh, A train might weigh hundreds or thousands of tons and be carrying hundreds or thousands of tons worth of supplies, but so could one decent-sized cargo ship. So a Arctic convoy showing up uh, in say, one of the Russian northern ports, could unload at a single stroke, assuming a reasonable number of the ships survived the journey, far more supplies than any single big supply train coming up through Iran could, and they would arrive faster, They would, um, and they would have a less journey time from port to either the front lines or to the factories, depending on what, what materials there were and how the Russians were going to use them. And it's not just the travel time you've got to take into account going across land there, it's also the capacity of the ports, and it's also getting the supplies there in the first place. Because if you're talking 1941-1942, the war in the desert is still ongoing, so sending large supply shipments through the Mediterranean, where the Italians and later the Flieger Corp 10 and the Africa Corps... Um, well, not the Africa directly, but the support units for them, are doing their level best to send anything flying an Allied flag to the bottom is pretty much out of the question. You've also got to, if you're taking supplies from America or Britain and you're heading that way, you've got to go go via the Atlantic, and there's a whole load of U-boats there. And assuming that you don't go via the Mediterranean, which is pretty much suicidal, you've got to brave all the Atlantic U-boats. You've got to go round Africa and back up the other side and there are still a few u-boats in the southern atlantic and a couple in the indian ocean as well which doesn't really help matters so once you've done that massive journey then you've got the logistical bottleneck of actually dropping everything off on it in iran and of course the flip side is yes in theory you could take goods from the u.s west coast but then you've got to go all the way around the pacific to avoid the japanese across the indian ocean again and you're back into iran whereas if you've got the supplies in Britain, then actually a relatively short hop through via the Arctic is immensely faster. And as we said, probably allows you to deliver significantly more goods because it's a matter of weeks as opposed to months in terms of transit transit time. And as we said, if you're sending goods from American East Coast factories, well, they're going to go through the Atlantic anyway. So they might as well go through the Atlantic to Britain. That's one risky voyage via the arctic that's two risky voyages and then they're pretty much on their doorstep as opposed to via the atlantic one risky voyage southern atlantic indian ocean another risky voyage plus massive amounts of time lost then through a limited logistics bottleneck up through iran and the southern ussr which whilst far less risky is again another massive time uh, lag that's lost so yeah that's but that's basically the summary that they did use it where they could but it was nowhere near enough of a supply chain to supply all the goods they were actually giving to Russia, and hence the Arctic convoys had to continue. 
And so finally, we have the channel admin, a section that's been missing for the last few dry docs because, well, there's not been an awful lot to say. Um, so a few bits of channel admin. There will be a video coming up in the next probably six, seven weeks on Western Approaches Command, which is going to follow this slightly different style. Um, I did mention this in one of the earlier dry docs whereby it's going to be partly standard video presentation and partly me actually presenting sort of live to camera uh, as I managed to get some of that recording done a few weeks ago. Now I will apologize in advance and I will also mention this in the at the beginning of that video. I appreciate the camera foot uh, camera footage quality and audio quality in those sections might not be entirely up to the standards that you're used to. Unfortunately, um, the, the camera and cameraman that I was due to use couldn't quite make it on the day, and so we had to make do with what camera equipment we had available. I will do my best, obviously, with enhancing the audio and picture quality in post-processing before I publish it, but that's just a heads up. Um, I do have access to far better recording equipment and audio equipment, so any future videos of that nature well, A, one, but hopefully have the cameraman with me, which will help, and B, even if not, we've we've got a few more bits of equipment now that will make that a lot easier. Um, secondly, obviously, there were a bunch of planned ones. Um, I've been talking to HMS Belfast, the Golden Hind, SS Great Britain. I'm still hoping to hear back from Chatham and the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. Um, and so we'll see how all of that works out in the future once the lockdown is done. Beyond that, the only other bit of channel admin is to say that I have now managed to complete a rather nice conservatory, which I'll be using as a filming studio. So some future videos that aren't based with on going out to physically see a ship, I might do from that perspective. Um, if that helps, maybe I'll do some of the dry dock. I'll have the questions there, but maybe I'll also have some of the question kind of live answering. Let me know what you think about that. Um, I have a rather nice screen and a uh, set of naval artwork to have in the background. And yeah, that's pretty much all the channel admin for the minute, other than to say, of course, thank you very much for listening once again. And uh, hope you're all keeping safe out there. And hope to see you again in another video. Now I've got to go off and start recording whatever monster the uh, Patreon dry dock for next week's going to turn into. Wish me luck. <laughs>